Morton A. Klein is the national president of the Zionist Organization of America, ZOA, the oldest pro-Israel group in the United States. Founded in 1897, ZOA played a major role in the Jewish state's reestablishment. Today, ZOA, with Mort Klein at the helm, is the leading major American Jewish organization courageously defending Israel and the Jewish people, fighting against all forms of anti-Semitism, including anti-Jewish boycotts, and promoting the Jewish people's lawful right to live in and settle historic Jewish lands. Mort Klein and ZOA spearheaded long battles to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, which is our topic of discussion today. Mort Klein is also a member of the National Council of APAC. He is a child of Holocaust survivors born in a displaced persons camp in Gunsburg, Germany. Mr. Klein is an economist who served in the Nixon, Ford, and Carter administrations. More recently, he has been invited to testify before Congress on multiple occasions and the Israeli Knesset. He has been named one of the top Jewish activists of the century, one of the top 10 Jewish leaders, and one of the best minds in the country. Mort Klein has been quoted internationally, and more than 300 of his articles and letters have been published around the world. He has also appeared on every single major television network. Quoting from the Wall Street Journal, when the history of the American Jewish struggle in these years is written, Mr. Klein will emerge as an outsized figure. And the New York Times has called Mr. Klein a man who ferrets out anti-Semitism wherever it is, a rare voice from the outset in the American Jewish community against the Oslo Accords, and an iconoclast who is a prolific speechmaker, writer, and congressional lobbyist. I am incredibly honored to introduce the man whom the Times of Israel calls America's most important Jew, Morton A. Klein. Thank you. Watch your step. I've only been speaking for 28 years, yet I'm a nervous wreck before every single speech. <laughs> Can't get used to it. <laughs> the few times in 28 years where I've been called and the, one of my talks was canceled, very rare, but it's happened, and they apologize profusely, I continue to thank them for canceling the speech. <laughs> this is the last day of Hanukkah. Most of us don't realize that the Maccabees lived in Samaria. They lived in Judea and Samaria. This is our homeland. That's where the Maccabees are from. <laughs> and the miracle of Hanukkah wasn't simply that the oil lasted for eight days. It was that the Maccabees fought and began to transform the Jews into being Jews again, to following the Torah and to identifying as Jews. That was the problem. Uh, and that's what the Maccabees were fighting against. And by the way, they were quite vicious in trying to convince Jews to, be, to become Jewish again and follow uh, Jewish laws. That is not uh, discussed, fortunately or unfortunately. <laughs> Leo Rostin is one of our great humorists. Yeah, he lists as one of the characteristics of Jewish humor, revenge over our oppressors by the use of guile or circumstance. I thought it's appropriate to uh, mention Ross and tell one of his very short stories uh, concerning that issue. <laughs> a fellow named Moish was sitting in a bar in his yarmulke, staring at his drink, when a large, troublemaking Gentile biker came over to Moish called him an ugly Jew, grabbed his drink, gulped it down, and with great intimidation said, so Jew boy, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Moish burst into tears immediately. <laughs> Come on, man, the biker said. I didn't think you'd cry. I can't stand to see a man crying, even the Jew boy. 
What's your problem, Moish? He had a name tag on him. <laughs> I added that by mistake, so I had to add that. <laughs> this is the worst day of my life, Moish said. I'm a complete failure, he said. I was late to an important meeting, and my boss immediately fired me. When I went to the parking lot, I found my car had been stolen, and I don't have insurance. I left my wallet in the cab that took me home, lost all my money in it. When I saw my wife, she immediately served me with divorce papers. And then I ran out of the house crying, the dog ran after me and bit me. <laughs> so I came to this bar to work up the courage to put an end to it all. I buy a drink, drop a poison capsule in my drink. <laughs> but enough about me, Mr. Biker, and my problems. How's your day going? I forget what I was going to talk about now today. <laughs> I would much rather do stand-up comedy. <laughs> Leo Rostin, the fabulous humorist. <clears throat> so among many of the things that Jews are having enormous trouble with, especially those who care about Israel, <laughs> are the problems in Israel. <laughs> One of those problems is the issue of Jerusalem. By the way, my wife uh, instructed me, as I do before in every speech, for those who heard me speak before, I have Tourette syndrome, a neurochemical disorder. I make sounds sometimes I can't control. I have facial tics. <laughs> and that's uh, one of the reasons that as soon as my wife showed any interest in me, I married her immediately. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to be alone. <laughs> Jerusalem is one of those issues. The Muslims are claiming it's their, it's their capital, it's their holy place. The world is proclaiming that. But for Jerusalem, we Jews have had a love affair with Jerusalem since time immemorial. The prophet Isaiah said about Jerusalem, Jerusalem is a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal jewel in the hand of your God. <laughs> Maimonides said the holiness of Jerusalem will persist into the future for it derives from the divine presence that can never cease. Even while in ruins, Jerusalem's sanctity has never lapsed for the Jewish people, said Maimonides. <laughs> Yet we Jewish people continue to be in danger of losing parts of our holy city, Jerusalem, and even all of it, because the Palestinian Arabs want all of it. <laughs> the Arabs have illegally built over 50,000 homes in Eastern Jerusalem, which is the real Jerusalem. Western Jerusalem is the newer part. East Jerusalem is the Jerusalem of the Torah, of the Bible, of history. <laughs> this has been funded by Saudi Arabia, Morocco, and Jordan. Uh, they've been built illegally. They have not even applied for licenses, and they build and build. And Israel, it's another story, uh, does very little about this. <laughs> They're afraid of repercussions from the world. Mahmoud Abbas gives speech after speech saying, Soon the day will come when a jihad for all of Jerusalem will lead Palestinian boys to march into Jerusalem, the capital of Palestine, and hoist the PLO flag from every mosque and minaret in our capital city of Jerusalem. He gives these speeches regularly. <laughs> PATV shows Jews praying at the Western Wall, with the narrator saying, the Israelis know for certain that our Palestinian Arab roots are deeper here than their false history. The Jews praying at the wall, says the narrator, is both sinful and filthy. <laughs> That's one of the reasons, because of these <laughs> attitudes and episodes, that Senator John Kyle, who's not remembered now <laughs> by most of us, from Arizona, he and I put together a legislation back in 95 to move the embassy to Jerusalem. <laughs> it was John Kyle and Newt Gingrich and Joe Lieberman were the principal people pushing this at the time, and ZOA. I asked every other major Jewish organization to join us on this issue to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Nobody would do it. Not APAC, not AJ Committee, not ADL, not the Conference of Presidents. Nobody would get on it thinking this will upset the Arabs. <laughs> We had six or seven senators who got on this legislation. That's all we had. It was looking hopeless. Then John Kyle said to me, let's go see Robert Dole. Robert Dole was the majority leader uh, of the Senate at the time, and he was running for president. 
We went to see him. John Kyle said, <laughs> Bob, he said to him, get on this legislation. <laughs> the Jews will love it. He said, you're running for president. This will only help you. He pleaded with him to get on it. And Bob Dole, who was not a friend of Israel, <laughs> got on the legislation. <laughs> Once he got on the legislation, suddenly we had 40 senators on it, from 8 to 40 in one swoop because he was the majority leader. <laughs> when that happened, APAC suddenly joined our fight for the, for the legislation. They were afraid, the Washington Post wrote an article about this, they were afraid that ZOA would get credit for this important legislation. <laughs> we, a vote uh, happened, it was 93 to 5 in the Senate, 347 to 37 in the House. Overwhelming, <laughs> couldn't be vetoed. Bill Clinton was against this legislation. He lobbied against it uh, to no avail. He was so angry about this legislation, he refused to sign the bill. He didn't sign it. <laughs> a bill becomes law in 30 days if it passes, if the president doesn't sign it. He didn't veto it <laughs> because 95% of both houses uh, voted for it. He knew that would be overridden, so he didn't veto it. <laughs> and as we <laughs> lobbied for this legislation, a senator put in a, a, a security waiver saying if the President of the United States decides for security reasons not to move the embassy, he doesn't have to move it. We fought like hell against this waiver. Nobody helped us, not APAC, not AJC, nobody helped us. We tried to get rid of this waiver and we failed. And do you know who was the leading force behind this? What senator? It was Senator Dianne Feinstein. <laughs> And who was the legislative aide that made this happen, who worked for Feinstein? Dan Shapiro, who became later the ambassador to Israel from the United States. He's the one who fought for it. Feinstein promoted it. We failed in getting rid of it. And then every president since then invoked that waiver to not move the embassy. Clinton, Bush, Obama, all invoked the waiver. We complained every six months about this waiver uh, being utilized. I couldn't get a single Jewish group to complain publicly. None. They wouldn't complain about it. <laughs> this, <laughs> so this passed, and as we know, the embassy was finally moved under uh, President Donald Trump. <laughs> but. <laughs> who, unlike most Jews, has Orthodox Jewish grandchildren. <laughs> he even says publicly, that wasn't the plan, but it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> I've had Jews tell me whose kids became Orthodox. They said the same thing to me. Wasn't the plan, but it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Despite this, the fight for Jerusalem by the Arabs continues very strongly. The PA, the Palestinian Authority Minister of International Planning, Nabil Shath, says in speech after speech, Israel demands control of the Temple Mount based on its claim that its fictitious temple stood there. <laughs> Mansour Abbas, who's now in the Israeli government, Ra'am, this anti-Israel Arab group in the Israeli Arab group, <laughs> says the Temple Mount is purely Muslim. He said it last week. No Jews should be allowed on the Temple Mount which is our holiest place. And notice it's called the Temple Mount. It's not called the Mosque Mount. Right? Because our temple was there. That's why it's called the Temple Mount. So when Sheikh Sabri says no Jew should be on the Temple Mount, he's acknowledging that uh, this was where our temple was. <laughs> and uh, other speeches by Abbas, he says the Al-Aqsa Mosque is ours. The Church of the Holy Sepulcher is ours. And the Jews and Christians have no right to defile it with their filthy feet. We will not allow them to, and we'll do everything in our power to protect Jerusalem, says Abbas. We bless every drop of blood that has been spilled for Jerusalem by our Arabs, we are, which, which is clean and pure blood. Blood spilled for Allah, Allah willing. Every martyr will reach paradise. Everyone wounded will be rewarded by Allah. He publicly calls for violence against Jews, for murder against Jews in speech after speech. You never read about this in the newspapers. The politicians don't say a word about this. Imagine if an Israeli politician said something of this nature. The world would go berserk, and rightly so. <laughs> and yet this is what's happening on a daily basis in the Palestinian Authority. <laughs> PATV repeatedly says there's no Jewish connection to Jerusalem. Arab textbooks say Jerusalem has no importance to Jews. 
only to Muslims. <laughs> the Palestinian Minister of Religious Affairs says the Western world is a Muslim property. It's part of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. <laughs> Once we control it, Jews will have to remain six feet away from a holy wall, says an official in the Palestinian Authority. The PA Ministry of Information <laughs> says after 70 years of Israeli excavation, has revealed Islamic holy places, Roman ruins, Armenian ruins, but no evidence of anything Jewish was revealed in the old city of Jerusalem. The Jews have implanted a biblical myth in the mind of the world. These are the lies being promoted regularly. We should all know this, but the media doesn't report it. Even the Jewish media doesn't report it. <laughs> and beyond historical revisionism, the Palestinian Authority disseminates the libel that Israel is acting to expel Arabs from Jerusalem in order to further Judaize the city, a horrible lie. These fabrications include PA accusations of Israeli destroying Islamic and Christian sites, a lie. They use hate language saying Israel's committing a criminal cultural massacre to chase Arab inhabitants away. The Jerusalem libel is meant to invoke religious hatred, portraying Israel and the Jews as the enemy and a threat to Arabs and Islam. This is one of the reasons that you have Arabs stabbing Jews, ramming Jews with cars, because of the inspiration given by speeches of their officials that we in America don't hear about. <laughs> it's not only the Palestinian Authority. Egyptian archeologist Abed al-Rahim Barakat uh, director of Antiquities in Sinai said, the legend about the Jewish temple is the greatest historic crime of forgery. Egyptians, <laughs> the Muslim religious trust, the Waqf, which Israel stupidly gave them control over the Temple Mount in that area. <laughs> they state uh, that Solomon and Herod, they didn't build this temple. They only renovated it, an uh, earlier structure dating to the time of Adam, these horrible lies. Uh, and according to another uh, uh, popular Muslim version, Speech after speech by imams are that our temple was in Yemen. It was never uh, in, in Jerusalem. <laughs> the Israeli historian Dr. Yitzhak Ryder is now publishing a book. He's been collating thousands of publications, religious legal rulings, statements, pronouncement of Muslim clergymen, historians, public figures on the subject of Jerusalem. It portrays a great Muslim denial, a denial of the Jewish connection to Jerusalem, to the Temple Mount, and to the temple itself. <laughs> this denial is found in books, in book and Arab book fairs all over Cairo, Europe, America, Asia, book after book promoting this denial, this lie. This is what's being taught to the world and what's being taught to the Arabs themselves. <laughs> When it comes to Jerusalem, it's extraordinary how the Palestinian Arabs, the Arab world, and the media continue to revise and distort the history of the truth of, Yer of Yerushalayim. <laughs> what is the truth of our beloved holy city of Jerusalem? Is it really historically Arab East Jerusalem? You frequently read in the paper, Arab East Jerusalem. <laughs> Jerusalem, an Eastern Jerusalem member, was the real Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the capital of Israel under King David 3,000 years ago. It has never been the capital of any other nation in history, except Israel. When the Arabs conquered Palestine, which is a region, not a country, in 716, they made Ramna their capital, not Jerusalem. They controlled Jerusalem then. They didn't make it their capital because they knew it wasn't holy to them. In Judaism, our holiest places are in Eastern Jerusalem, both Jewish temples, the Temple Mount, the Western Wall, and also Jewish Hadassah Hospital, the Jewish National Library, the Jewish Quarter. Hebrew University are all in Eastern Jerusalem. <laughs> Over 20 times a day, for thousands of years, we Jews prayed in our daily prayers. We say to Jerusalem, thy city shall we return with joy. May God spread his protection over our holy city. We say next year in Jerusalem, during our Seder, during Yom Kippur and other times, numerous Jewish holidays, fast days, religious ceremonies commemorating Jerusalem and the traditional Jewish wedding invitations, we say, Mala et Yerushalayim al Rosh Chosenu. We'll raise Jerusalem up the pin pinnacle of our joy. <laughs> Glass is broken to commemorate the destruction of the temple and the loss of Jerusalem. <laughs> the Muslims have nothing like this in their liturgy, in their religion. <laughs> Three times a year, we fast and we mourn the destruction of the temple and the loss of Jerusalem. There's a famous story of Napoleon coming to a synagogue in Tisha B'Av where everyone is crying and mourning, saying, what's going on? He said, we're crying because we lost our temple and we lost Jerusalem back then. 
And he says, a people, Napoleon said, that remembers to mourn so long the loss of a city and the homeland is sure to regain both. And he was right. <clears throat> Our Jewish holy books mentions the word Jerusalem 700 times. How many times is the word Jerusalem in their holy book, the Koran? Zero. Zero. Exactly right. Zero. How on earth is this a holy city to them if it's not written a single time in their holy book? What kind of ugly, stupid lie is this? <laughs> I wrote an op-ed in, in the Washington Post uh, years ago about this issue, how it's not holy to Muslims. <laughs> they published seven letters. Cheryl Silver may remember this. She was at the Washington Post at that time. <laughs> the <laughs> They published seven letters attacking my op-ed. Seven, not one, not two, not three, seven. <laughs> and someone there told me they were threatened for having published this op-ed <laughs> about Jerusalem. <laughs> and in it they say, Jerusalem is mentioned in the Holy, in the Holy Quran. <laughs> that Muhammad went from the farthest mosque, al-Masjid al al-Aqsa, to, to heaven. And that means Jerusalem. Now, of course, why not say Jerusalem? It's easy to say Jerusalem. Well, first of all, Muhammad, they say, went from the farthest mosque. Second of all, it was a dream. It didn't even happen. The Quran said he had a dream about this. I have a lot of dreams. Thank God most of them don't come true. <laughs> I won't share with you any of them. Some of them deal with my Jewish leadership colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> I didn't say what the dream was about. <laughs> so it says from the farthest mosque. So could this mean Jerusalem? When the Koran was written, there was not a single mosque in Jerusalem. None, zero. So of course the farthest mosque couldn't mean Jerusalem. There was no mosque there. So this is a total lie that this means Jerusalem. And yet Jews are always telling me this, that this is the proof that Jerusalem is holy to them. <laughs> of the four quarters in Jerusalem, the Jewish, Muslim, Ar Armenian, and Christian, the Muslim quarter is the youngest. When the British gave this quarter over to the Muslims, it was 70% Jewish. That's how many Jews were there. In fact, the shopkeepers, Muslim and Jewish, kept their shops closed on Shabbos back then because they couldn't do business. It was Shabbos. Jews wouldn't go and shop in those days. <laughs> Jerusalem has been like a magnet for Jews. Since the mid-1800s, how many of you know this? The majority of people living in Jerusalem since the mid-1800s have been Jews. Is that extraordinary? We've been the majority. There's no other city on earth outside of Jerusalem that's had a Jewish majority since the 1840s. Not New York, not LA, maybe Boca, only Boca. <laughs> <laughs> they built a few shuls, you know, Hasidim came. You know. <laughs> the first Chabad in 1872, I think it was. <laughs> And that initial rabbi is still there. He's 117. <laughs> they, they never pass away, these Hasidim. It's really unbelievable. It's because they want the beards to be extremely long. They've got to live long to get that to happen. <laughs> in Herzl's diary, he wrote that he went into, arrived in Jerusalem in 1898 and, quote, the streets were alive with Jews sauntering in the moonlight. He wrote in 1898. <laughs> I have a Bedeker's guide to Jerusalem. Bedeker's is the oldest travel guide in the world out of Stuttgart, Germany. <laughs> I wrote a series of anti-Bedeker articles in the in newspapers. <laughs> uh, they were very, their guides to Jerusalem and Israel were terrible. So they actually, as a, one of their gifts, they gave me a guide to Jerusalem in 1907. <laughs> uh, it was in German. What did they give me? <laughs> Fortunately, I was born in Germany so I can actually read it. <laughs> The 1907 Guide to Jerusalem says there were 60,000 people in Jerusalem in 1907. 13,000 Christians, 7,000 Muslims, 40,000 Jews. 1907 Guide to Jerusalem. <laughs> we should be screaming this. Our officials, our leaders should be making these points, letting people know about this. Nobody knows this. The Jews face Jerusalem when we dab and the Muslims play, 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 face Mecca. Many articles have said that 
uh, Jerusalem is important for Muslims for political reasons, not religious reasons. <laughs> Professor Sivan of Hebrew U said when the Christian crusaders captured Jerusalem from the Muslim control, there was no sock, shock or sense of any religious loss. <laughs> and there's been no important place of Muslim learning ever built and established in Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> In the last few years, the top archaeologist, Eilat Mazur, <coughs> found a 2,600-year-old <coughs> clay seal impression, which bared the name of Gedalia ben Pashur, which was recently uncovered, completely intact, un uh, under the ancient city of David in Jerusalem. <coughs> the name appears in the book of Jeremiah, this name Gedalia, together with that of Yechiel ben Shilamayahu, whose name was found in an identical clay bull in the same area, the two men were ministers in the court of King Zedekiah, the last Jewish king of Jerusalem. This was an extraordinary find. <laughs> and there's been other finds actually showing a, a, a bulla in the ground in Jerusalem with the name of King Hezekiah, a Jewish king there. Obviously, the Jews lived in this area. And qu quite remarkable, <laughs> an Egyptian Muslim scholar, <laughs> renowned in Arabic and Islamic studies, Yusuf Zaydan, said there is, quote, there is no connection between Jerusalem and Islam. When Islam was founded during the seventh century, he said Jerusalem was a holy city to the Jews, not to the Muslims. Zidane's a director of the Manuscript Center Museum at the Library of Alexandria, he's a major guy. He said, Al-Aqsa is not ours, it is the Jews. They are the ones that rightfully belong and own Jerusalem. It's amazing Zidane was not assassinated for having said this. <laughs> <laughs> and in this book, which I happen to have, <laughs> Al Haram Al Sharif Jerusalem, put out by the Supreme Muslim Council 1924, this was the major Muslim group, <laughs> <laughs> they wrote that the Temple Mount is a site of uncontested importance to the Jews. In this book, it's one of the oldest in the world. Its sanctity dates back from the earliest times. Its identity with the site of Solomon's temple is beyond dispute. This is the spot, according to universal belief, on which King David, the Jewish king, built an order, all altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Later, the book, it says, the underground structure known as King Solomon's Tables dates back as far as the construction of Solomon's temple, and it was used as a place of refuge by Jews at the time of the conquest of Jerusalem by Titus in the year 70 AD. So their own booklet acknowledges the truth which no one ever speaks about. I have this in my hand where they recognize that of course this Jerusalem is holy to the Jews. That's why they never made it their capital where they controlled it. <laughs> Unfortunately, the world is listening to Abbas and the Palestinian Authority, not to Israel and Jews. The Vatican and the European Union said, we must consider Jerusalem a corpus separatum. It's separate from Israel. UN resolution after resolution for decades. <laughs> says Jerusalem is occupied territory. It's illegal and null and void for Israel to administer and have jurisdiction over the holy city of Jerusalem. These are UN resolutions. And we deplore any state that moves its embassy there. And then most recently, UN Resolution 2334, which Obama organized, lobbied for, threatened to get this resolution passed, which says every piece of land past the 67 line, including Jerusalem, is occupied territory. And unlike other presidents, he refused to veto this resolution. He abstained. Why would he veto it? He's the one who organized for this to happen. This was the last thing that Obama did before he was left to the presidency. And I, in fact, called Chuck Schumer, Senator Schumer, <laughs> in September that year. This happened in December. I said, Senator Sch Schumer, I'm hearing rumors that Obama is putting together a resolution to say everything past the Sixth line is Arab territory. I said, you've got to talk to him, you've got to stop this. More, don't be ridiculous, he said, this is not happening. I said, but I'm hearing it is happening. More, the president knows if he tried to do this, all hell would break loose in Congress. We would go crazy on him, so don't worry about it. <laughs> well, in fact, <laughs> I begged him to speak to the president. I said, please speak to him. He said, okay, I will. Then he called me <laughs> and he said, he isn't able to get a meeting with him, and he did not speak to him. <laughs> and this of resolution, of course, happened, and he nor anyone else said one word about it. And yet it passed uh, 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 because America uh, vetoed, did not veto this resolution. 
Jerusalem mayors have said for years, pleading with the Jewish community to fight for Jerusalem. We haven't done it <laughs> in any serious way. And what did the Arabs do with Eastern Jerusalem when they controlled it? That's the test. When they controlled it, what did they do with it? Was it holy to them? Did they transform it into a beautiful and sacred city? <laughs> From 1948 to 67, Jordan controlled Eastern Jerusalem, which is the real Jerusalem. <laughs> What did they do with it? They allowed it to become a slum. There was virtually no water, electricity, or plumbing there. They built slum housing up against the Western Wall. There were 58 shuls in Eastern Jerusalem. How many realize that? 58 synagogues. Jordan dynamited and destroyed all 58 to re remove any Jewish presence in Eastern Jerusalem. And no one said a word about it. <laughs> they killed large numbers of Jews that were there, and the rest fled. Colonel Tal al uh, of Jordan said the Jewish quarter became a graveyard of death and destruction when Jordan controlled it for those 19 years. The Mount of Olives Cemetery, the oldest and largest Jewish cemetery in the world, uh, 40,000 headstones were destroyed. They used the concrete to make latrines and roads. They totally desecrated the largest Jewish cemetery. Nothing was said. No Jews and not even Christians were allowed to visit the holy sites in Eastern Jerusalem. And listen to this. Not a single Arab leader, except the King of Jordan, ever visited Jerusalem when they controlled it. If it's so holy to them, why didn't any Arab leader visit Jerusalem? Because it's not holy. They don't care about it. They only want to take away our holy place, our guts. <laughs> they made life so miserable for Christians from 1967. 70%, 7 percent of the Christians left Eastern Jerusalem. They weren't allowed to build a church, renovate a church, and they were forced to teach the Koran to Christian students uh, uh, under uh, Jordanian rule. <laughs> the city's importance was diminished. Amman became the capital. They built the, the king's residences there, the universities in Amman. Even the, the Friday prayers were from a mosque in Amman, not in Jerusalem. <laughs> but it's interesting, after 67, when the city became under Israeli control, the Palestinian Arabs again made Jerusalem the centerpiece of their political program. The Dome of the Rock became the centerpiece of pictures everywhere, uh, from Yasser Arafat's office to the corner grocery. Uh, suddenly, Jerusalem was wholly important to them when the Israelis took it back. Beforehand, nobody gave a damn, no Arab gave a damn about, uh, about Jerusalem. <laughs> Every day we make a Shemona Esrei prayer. That prayer is a central prayer in our Jewish service, refers to rebuilding of United Jerusalem. Every day we make this prayer. <laughs> this is the same prayer that we recite today, that our grandparents recited, our great grandparents recited, pleading for a return to Jerusalem. Hundreds of years ago we're making this prayer when it seemed impossible we could ever have Jerusalem. And yet we kept praying and praying for Jerusalem. That's how much it meant to us. We were driven out of Jerusalem by Babylonians, we outlasted them and returned. We were exiled by Romans. We outlasted them and returned. They built an arch of Titus in Italy to glorify taking down our Jerusalem. We outlived Titus and Titus's family line and their whole empire. And we, we returned. This is our holy city. And polls show in America. Americans by four to one say Jerusalem is a city that the Jews should have, not the Arabs. Four to one. <laughs> The notice, noted British scholar and writer Christopher Sykes said, yes, there is a holy place in Jerusalem for Muslims, but it has no major Islamic significance. They have a mosque there. Look, New York City, we have a thousand Jewish synagogues in New York City. Is New York City holy to Jews? For most Jews, no. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the evidence? <laughs> the evidence is clear. Jerusalem is holy to Jews. It is not holy to Muslims. We should make that clear in every speech. <laughs> in fact, I gave a speech, a similar speech to this, at Sinai Temple. I'm mentioning the name in Los Angeles. It's maybe the biggest conservative temple in the country. Rabbi Wolpe, David Wolpe, a famous rabbi, is the rabbi. I gave a speech there about Jerusalem, how it's not holy to Muslims and it's holy to Jews. Rabbi Wolpe came up to the mic after I got a standing ovation. <laughs> It was all, the synagogue was filled with Iranian Jews. They know. Wolpe came up, I said, I see you like the speech. I have to come up and say something more to my friend. I know him from Philadelphia. We've known each other a long time, but I don't want more client or any Jews to tell the Muslims what's holy to them. 
I don't want the Muslims telling me, we Jews, what's holy to us. I took the mic and I said, Rabbi Wolpe, suppose tomorrow the Muslims say, Los Angeles is holy to us. We want Beverly Hills and Brentwood. <laughs> they can say that. Does that mean you have to do it? If there's proof that LA is holy to them, we got to deal with it. If there's proof Jerusalem is holy to them, we have to deal with it. But the evidence shows there is no proof. If there's no proof, simply they're saying it, we have to call them out and say, this is absurd. We will not tolerate this sort of lie. We will continue to tell the truth. <laughs> you know, for 20 years, I worked as a biostatistician. I was actually in science. Uh, and Fauci says he is science. Actually, I am science. I want you to, you got it wrong. I am science. <laughs> I am Jewish historical science. <laughs> By the way, I worked with Fauci in the 70s. I can tell you about him. They're similar to my dreams about Jewish leaders. <laughs> so I worked with Linus Pauling for many years. I was a biostatistician, not a chemist. Uh, I helped establish, uh, set up the experiments and analyze the data when the data came in. And Pauling would always say to me after an experiment, more, what is the data, Pauling of course was the greatest chemist who ever lived, two-time Nobel Prize winner. Uh, all of structural chemistry is Pauling, uh, hybrid orbitals, electronegativity, the structure of the alpha helix. I'm sure you're all fascinated by that. Uh, <laughs> I went into biostatistics, not chemistry, because I also was not fascinated by that. <laughs> He'd say more, <laughs> Tell me what the data, the evidence, require me to believe. Don't tell me more about your hopes and dreams for this experiment, what you wanted the experiment to show. We have data, now you tell me what the data say, that's what we have to believe. The same way here, the evidence requires us to know the truth that Jerusalem is not holy to Muslims. It has never been holy to Muslims, it is only holy to Jews. And we should scream that from the rooftops. Our rabbis, our religious leaders, our Jewish leaders, the evangelical Christians, everyone, you never hear that. We're afraid to say it because it's not woke to say Jerusalem's not holy to Muslims. It's only the truth. But most of what's woke is not true. We have to stop getting, start getting rid of what's woke and start telling the truth again. <laughs> <laughs> a number of prime ministers have said publicly, not only can you interfere with Jerusalem, you must interfere when it comes uh, to Jerusalem. While Arab leaders lie, we have to start telling the truth. All of these reasons are the reasons why we Jews will never give up holy Jerusalem under any circumstances. It was given to all the Jews by the Lord our God, King of the universe. We Jews, yes, we Jews <laughs> will never, ever, agree or permit the redivision of Judaism's holiest city. We Jews will never permit Jerusalem to become a new Berlin with a new Berlin wall. Never again will we allow that. <laughs> Thoreau said, I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of men to elevate his life by a conscious endeavor. Our conscious endeavor must be to fulfill the words of Isaiah. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, who shall never hold their peace day or night. We will protect Jerusalem, maintain Jerusalem as the unified Jewish city it has been and always will be. <laughs> we should never try to appease the Muslims, the Arabs, by giving parts of Jerusalem away. It won't work. Winston Churchill fame famously said, those who appease the crocodile will simply be eaten last. It doesn't work anyway. <laughs> In fact, when Churchill <laughs> complained bitterly about the Munich deal, giving away parts of Czechoslovakia, <laughs> he was condemning it, saying, this will bring war, not peace. And Lady Astor came over to him and said, I'm so angry with you, Winston. You keep attacking this peace deal we finally have. She said to him, if I were your wife, I would put poison in your tea, Winston. And she said, and if, he said, if I were your husband, I would drink it. <laughs> uh, 
uh, Winston was a clever guy. <laughs> now I'm going to end by reading a very short statement, relatively short, made by a very important man today. It was made in 1995. There's a reason I'm reading it. <laughs> the statement is this. Concentrate on what it, what it says, because I'm going to tell you who said it. <laughs> Those familiar with the Jewish people know the central meaning that the ancient city of Jerusalem has for Jews everywhere. Time and again, empires have tried to sever the umbilical cord that unites Jews with their capital. They have destroyed the temple. They have banished the Jews from living in Jerusalem. They have limited the number of Jews allowed to immigrate to that city. And finally, in this century, they tried simply to eliminate and massacre the Jews. They may have succeeded in destroying physical structures and lives, but they have never succeeded in eliminating the Jewish presence in Jerusalem or in cutting the spiritual bond between Jews and their cherished capital. After the horrific events of the Holocaust, the Jewish people have returned to claim what many rulers have tried to deny them for centuries, the right to peaceful coexistence existence in their own country, in their own capital of Jerusalem. How many of us can forget that poignant photograph of an unnamed Israeli soldier breaking down in tears and prayer as he reached the Western Wall after his army liberated the eastern half of the city in the Six Day War? Those tears told a story, a story of a people long denied their rightful place among nations, a people denied access to their most hallowed religious sites in Jerusalem, a people who had finally, after long tribulation, come home. <laughs> the only way said this senator at the time. There will be peace in the Middle East, is for the Arabs to know there is no division between the US and Israel. None, zero, none. As the Israelis and Palestinians begin their negotiations, it should be clear to all that the US stands squarely behind Israel, our close friend and ally. Moving and having the US Embassy to Jerusalem sends the right signal, not a destructive signal. To do less would be to play into the hands of those who will try their hardest to deny Israel the full attributes of statehood, including their capital of Jerusalem. Does anyone know who said that? It was Brandon. <laughs> Joe Biden made this speech in 95, <laughs> promoting moving the embassy. <laughs> I urge all of you to write to your members of the House and the Senate. Urge them to listen to what Biden said. Write to the White House to not allow the US to open up a consulate for the terrorist dictatorship of the Palestinian Authority. <laughs> write to your senators, write to your members of Congress. Don't open a consulate in Jerusalem, for God's sakes. If you have to open one up, of course, there's Ramallah. But you shouldn't appease at all this terrorist dictatorship who pays Arabs to murder Jews. He pays Arabs to murder Jews. They get lifetime pensions, every Arab or their family, if they kill a Jew. And the more Jews they murder, the larger their lifetime pension. We want to appease this terrorist, Nazi-like regime. It's outrageous. And so we have to let that known to our members of the House and Senate and tell them about what Joe Biden said, and tell Joe Biden to keep to what words he so wisely and properly said in 1995. <laughs> 2,500 years ago, <laughs> on the shores of Babylon, the Jewish people facing the first exile proclaimed, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its cunning. If I do not remember thee, Jerusalem, may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. It's an oath that Jews have been faith kept faithfully ever since all over the world, and will continue to do so. <laughs> the book of Joshua says to be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord your God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. With the strong will and determination and faith of our people, with the help of the Israel Defense Forces and the Israeli people, with the help of Almighty God, ZOA, with your help, will work to ensure that Israel with Jerusalem as its undivided capital will remain under the sovereignty of the Jewish people until the end of time. We will succeed, we will prevail. Thank you very much.